Okay. Um, what was the deal with the uh, room yonder across the way closed for today or, or like in use? Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. So um, today we're going to be uh, carrying on uh, our discussion of test case design. How to come up with good test cases. Um, we talked about a couple of principles for picking test cases. Who remembers two of the techniques that we identified? One we spent a longer time on, and one I sort of hit on at the end of the, the last class. Yes, or something. Good. Equivalence cost systems one. So you, you figure out, say, for a given field or a given Given, given input, uh, the equivalence classes that apply for it, or for a set of those fields or inputs. Remember, like start, finish, the string. You figure out kind of a set of things that go together as an equivalence class. Uh, so that was one of the, the main techniques. The idea is, look, if we don't test a whole equivalence class, we can't really say we've done thorough testing at all. I mean, if, at least if you need one test case for each equivalence class, because each equivalence class is often handled differently, right? It, it, it's going to be potentially handled in the code differently, and therefore you need to test it. That was the idea. Uh, you might test a couple things within each equivalence class. That's great, but at least check one thing. Otherwise, you can't, as we say, pass the red face test. You can't say, look someone in the eye and say, yeah, go test it. So equivalence class testing is a foundational thing, and I'll talk about it a little bit more in relation to what we're going to speak about today. In just a moment. The other technique was called what? Yes, out of your mouth. Yeah, boundary value test, and and that kind of built on some of the ideas of equivalence classes because often we have like ranges of values that go together in an equivalence class. Right, um, and you test the boundaries of that range, the extreme values, what are sometimes called fairly or unfairly corner cases, kind of cases that are tricky to handle. And often the software developers have to think explicitly about these cases. Um, and and they may not handle them correctly, or they can have an off by one error where you know they they don't handle that last case by accident, for example. Uh, and you know, we we spot those off by one errors. Off by one errors are one of the most common ones. Um, it will miss handling, you know, the final case or the very first case or whatever. Um and it could be for all different reasons, but we handle the boundary values because often they're the tricky ones. They're the ones that fall through the cracks. So the ones that aren't thought about, aren't handled, or um, you know, are just by neglect. Someone puts in a minus sign, or they forget to subtract one to the length of an array, or whatever, and it blows up. So um, those are are great techniques, important techniques. We're going to be talking today about something that builds on, can use those principles, but specifically for the case where we have many fields or many inputs together. Those techniques um, you can think of very readily for applying to a particular input. And I kind of waved my hands and said they, they apply to sort of sets of inputs that go together. But you know, when we're dealing with a set of different inputs, you know, different possibilities, different fields of a form, um, we have to often realize that sometimes it's infeasible to do a really thorough ex exploration of all the, what I would call the combinatorics. So we can't test everyone for all the possibilities that we want. There's a thing called the curse of dimensionality which basically has to do with the fact that as you, as you increase the number of inputs, if you're gonna test each input for n different values, and let's suppose you have 
you know, a number M of, of different inputs, each of which is to be tested M times. The number of possibilities goes up as N, N to the M. For each of these inputs, you have N possibilities. So you have okay. M for the first, you have M for the second, M for the third, M for the fourth, if they are not constrained to each other. We actually saw a case where they were constrained to each other. Start had to be less than finish and that sort of thing. But if they're not, they kind of multiply out, you know, M times, right? And that's why you get this N to the M, N times N, 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 M times, right? Um, and it becomes often computationally infeasible to test all of this. Um, okay, so we're going to talk today about ways to, to handle this. And the main technique we're going to talk about is something called orthogonal arrays. And orthogonal arrays provide us a certain guarantee of thoroughness of exploration while avoiding this this curse of dimensionality, where we have to test every single common. Um, so we get this, this blob, this, this pi means, anyone know what the pi means? Yes, Marissa. So you multiply things. Yeah, we, we write in math notation, we write a sigma sign when we want to sum things up. So if you want to sum up, you know, I from I equal zero to M or something like that. Get I times, or sorry, N times N minus one over two. Yeah, along this line. And we're going to tie where, where it's a multiplication of this sum zero, one, two, three, four, all the way over to M. And this, this would be you know, multiply um, all numbers from one to one. So n um, So just a pi, and it reflects the fact you get this multiple thing. Multiply, 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 multiply. Um, and this is not merely like some you know, nice math idea. I mean, the fact is, when you go to test the form, this comes up all the time. You know, I want to pull up an example that was fairly current for this. And I went to my Gmail inbox and I went and I looked at the search for it. And, you know, you could say, like, press the, the, the thing that allows you to specify more search options in Gmail. And so you can fill in from, to, subject, has the words. You know, doesn't include certain words. The size of it is greater than or less than a certain size. Uh, the date when it was sent. And one of the reasons I pulled this down was just to convey that, like, some of these have a bunch of choices. These drop downs, right? They have a bunch of possibilities. And you might say, well, okay, so there's only one, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, eight, nine, ten, something like that, eleven different fields. But if each of them has if each of them has even two possibilities you want to test, two to the eleven is two or four eight. A lot of a lot of possibilities. Right? Um a lot of possibilities to test, particularly if you're a manual test, or if you have to create test cases. Or if it's laborious to test. In this case, it isn't terribly bad. You could generate things, but in other cases, this is a, a really dated slide now. It's from this very good book, though, uh, by where is it? Oh, it's down at the bottom. Excuse me. Didn't get in here. By Craig and Gaskill called Systematic uh, Testing. And um, this is what's called uh, an orthogonal array. And it's designed to deal with the fact that we want to test combinations, but we don't want to test all possibilities. So the idea is instead of doing all possibilities, having this so-called combinatorial explosion 
That's what this is called. It's, it exhibits the curse of not to come up, but of dimensional. Right? Um, this is the curse of dimensionality. These are the counter dimensions, and it blows up with it. It also, we say, it has a combinatorial explosion. Okay? A combinatorial explosion. Not to be confused with a combinational explosion. Um, the combinational logic and your combinatorial expl explosion, not explosion. Um, Okay, so normally it's a, combina a combinatorial explosion, but here we actually have a cl clever way of dealing with it. Instead of testing three times three, no, times, yeah, times three times three uh, here, uh, basically uh, times uh, three here, um, here dealing with which would be 81 possibilities. Three times three times three times three. Uh, you're dealing with uh, a small number. You're dealing with nine possibilities. Now you may say, "Well, where did they pull these out?" Of? Ah, this is designed clever. Every pair of possibilities is in. Every pair of the is in. Every pair of this one is in. Every pair of this one is in here. Every pair of this sorry this and this is in there as well. And, and so on. And so you get all pairs included. They're just chosen a really clever way. This is called an orthogonal ring. It's also referred to as something when you undergo pairwise testing or all pairs testing. Um, and mathematically, it's related to things like Latin squares and so on, which are a very interesting mathematical objects for systematically exploring certain spaces. Um, so every pair of area values it, it are included at least once, but it's not all combinations. Um, it, and often it reflects the fact that when we have a problem in our system, it's because we have a combination of two, two things that individually work. They work them, you know, individually, but when you combine them, There's a blow. You sometimes can get that only if you have a certain third one, but it's very common. It's most common if you have two. This doesn't play nicely with this, um, for example. And so here's another case where you know you boil it down from 125 possibilities: five for this, five for that, five for that, five from five from five, like this, five from five from five. Three times because there's three columns. Instead of dealing with all possibilities, you only deal with with uh, twenty five, and that's that's all. Now you may ask, what's the big deal these days? Computers are fast. Why not test all hundred twenty five? Well, look, this slide is really dated, but if if testing means configuring a certain system. You know, having a certain system configuration where you have a certain browser, a certain plugin, a certain server on a certain operating system. Like, it's going to really hurt if you have to do any one of those compared to doing them. Right? Um, and really, what you're hinging off of here is you have a count of the maximum count for any possibility um, and the second maximum. Of any of those possibilities multiplied by each other. That's the number of pairs that generally you're going to have to consider. And so here it's nine possibilities. The other feature is there's systems online to generate these. You can you can call up. Um, I know there's websites that have done it at times, and I think there's um, packages that allow you to do it for some some calculation systems or plugins or whatever. But the idea is you can boil down a ton of possibilities into a lot fewer. And I'll call them. That's the general idea here. Um, and uh, you know the uh, the general principle is have the columns in order with this decreasing number of possibilities for each. Uh, and um, and you can save by orders of magnitude uh, if you look at it. 
this is for all possibilities, and this is for the number you actually have to explore pairwise. So you may ask, well, why is this particularly like uh, beneficial? Well, again, the issue is pairwise things often blow up. That's where the problem is. So you don't have to you don't have to include all possibilities for these, like one where this is empty and one where it has a value, one where this is empty and has a value, one where this is empty and this has a value, etc. You instead have you pick your test cases so that it any possible value, any you know, where it's empty or it has a value for each of these is explored at least once. But it's not all possible combinations of them. It's the small ones. That's the idea with uh, orthogonal loops. You're testing all pairs of values. So all pairs include, uh, are included at least once. Um, so you know you have A with I at least once. You have A with J at least once. A with K at least once. L A with L. D with each of those. You have M with you know, Z at least once, M with Y, M with D, M with X at least once, somewhere in this whole thing. But you don't have all possibilities. Okay, you can generate these things automatically. There is a routine for you manually generating them, but I don't think you want to generate them. You just want to specify these are the possibilities for each field. Go generate it. Go generate the test cases, and it'll be often orders of magnitude less. Than what what would be required for exhaustive testing. So that's the idea. Any questions on this before I go on to another thing? This is called all pairs testing. Let's see if they can so all pairs testing and the construct, the formalism is called orthogonal arrays. Orthogonal because we're kind of testing possibilities for this one and possibilities for that one or possible values of each pair. Any questions? I'm not going to ask you to create one of those arrays uh, on a test, but I want you to know the, the idea of it. Particularly if it involves a lot of manual setup, this may spare you a lot of a lot of possibilities. Imagine you have you want to test your system. Each of you are building systems across platforms, right? So look, clearly you want to test it on an iPhone and you want to test it on an Android system, right? At least. And maybe you want to test it on the latest version of Android and an earlier version of Android and the last three versions of iOS. And you know, beyond that, possibly you want to test it with a large screen device and a small screen device, or something like that, an iPad, and a um, as well as a phone for each for each one of those. Uh, so it's an Android test. Again, we're starting to talk about a lot of testing. So if you could do it in an intelligent way, so the test that you use to test for the tablet, you're also testing it in an earlier version of Android, et cetera. You know, that may spare you a lot of what doing all the setup, finding devices. Okay. Can you see the practicality of that? You know, you're basically really reducing the number of possibilities. Okay. Okay, so let's uh let's go on to the last thing I'm going to talk about here, which is called conformational random testing. Um What's your projects to do some random testing? The idea behind random testing is really easy. You generate random cases according to some principled understanding of what, how they should be handled, right? So maybe you generate random cases that will achieve a certain risk score for the youth at risk, right? Maybe Kira specifies some algorithm for specifies some rule for how to judge risk. You know, if they are fall within this category, you add three. Within that one, you add two. You 
increase it by four if they've got a passive abusive relationship, whatever it is. You could generate a set of random possibilities within a given risk level and make sure it returns the correct risk level. Right? Make sure it's generated. You know the rule, so you figure out cleverly some cases within that rule. And maybe you have it generate within certain ranges just to ensure that it always gives the correct rule. Simple enough, right? Um, for the food plate waste system, you could generate random weights, right? Uh, from a scale, as if you're getting random weights, or you could generate. I don't know, random um, random container types or what have you, or uh, information for um, a random number of dishes each kid takes. And the idea is you, you do this in a way with some expectation of what the what correct behavior should be. For the risk score, you know what risk score should be done. For the plate waste study, you know, whatever you generated should be stored in the database, right? So you generate this random stuff and you start in the database and you retrieve it and make sure that it matches. Hmm? Those are kind of Should be pretty straightforward and it's useful. Um, maybe you generate a string that has weird, non ASCII characters in it or something that you never tried, the bell of character, character of non uh and and you know if you find it doesn't handle it or what have you or you generate a carriage return as a part of the string and it it ends up you know bombing up or something um there's some cases where it's really 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 easy um so you know you generate some things and you test if the results are correct or if at least they match some broad features. Then you don't know the exact answer that you're testing. But at least you want to check that it, what you do get has some basic features of possibility. So suppose you say, I want to go from Dustin Moon to Seattle. And it generates some mental flux. Mm -hmm. Then at least you want to make sure that they're contiguous, meaning if you go on each flight, it says that's the to Calgary. And then Calgary to Salt Lake City, and Salt Lake City to Seattle, or something like that. Or maybe it's Saskatoon to Calgary, Calgary to Vancouver, Vancouver to Seattle. Um, you want to make sure they're contiguous. A goes to B, B goes to C, C goes to D, that you know they connect, right? Um, that's something you can easily check. You you request a random a random path, you know, from city to city, and then you you confirm that the path that's obtained has base plausibility. Do you know if the exact price is correct? Maybe not for this test, but you make sure it makes sense in terms of contiguity. Right. So there's a team, I think I may have mentioned this team in this class a number of years ago, before the, the city of Saskatoon and its click and ride or whatever the system that allows you to figure out bus routes. Maybe they don't have that anymore and they just let you use Google or Transit or whatever. But um, back then, there was no system to do it. And so they created a bus routing app for this class. They had an online web app that you know you could request bus routes, and so you could say, "I want to go from my house to the airport." And uh, you know they had a very clever algorithm for it. They they really prided themselves at creating a a clever algorithm that would search the search space in a, in a clever way. Um, unfortunately, uh, they didn't test certain features like here. So, you know, if they had only generated random pairs of all bus stops, they would have found that sometimes it didn't work. So it would do weird things like it would say, go from, you know, okay, pick up the bus on Main Street, go to Plateau. Great. 
So plus we all have time. Okay, to the to the twenty third street or whatever it is. Plus stuff there. Yeah. Plus uh, terminal there. Yeah. Plus mall. And then they and then it would say like get off the bus there and transfer to another bus. And then it would say get off the bus again and transfer to another bus. So it had this repeated disembarkation, reembarkation somehow. And they could have found that if they had done something like this. Incidentally, another thing they didn't do along the ideas of assertions is, you know, we think about assertions for like testing three predictions. But another thing you can do is compare your algorithm with the brute force algorithm that you know of. As computer scientists, we know sometimes the easy algorithms to write are too inefficient, right? It's, it's really easy to brute force one, but it's inefficient. So we spend time creating really efficient one. And all that's good, but you know, you could assert that your uber efficient one that you think should work matches the brute force one. And you might say, well, that's crazy. We're running both. Well, for testing, that's fine, right? You just run it in test mode. You have an, ass an assertion that is removed at time of production. But every test case you run, if you compare, is the brute force one compatible with, does it give the same answer as the clever one? And they would have found that there did, and sometimes that it problems. Um, so just, you know, leaving money on the table. Um, so confirmation random testing is sometimes really easy to spot a correct answer. Think about a square root function. Square root might be hard for you to, to write, but it is easy for you to test because if you get a square root back, a number of the supposedly the square root of a given number you gave it, what can you do? You say, take the square root of 10 and you get some number back. How can you check if that's correct? Yes. Um, I was say you could assert that uh, it's not. Precisely. Yeah, so it's easy to check, right? Hard to write, but easy to be fun. It's sort of like, um, you know, it, you can really easily confirm. Remind me your name? Uh, Zach. Zach, thanks. Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to recognize you better without my glasses on. It'll help. Um, okay, so so yeah, this is easy to check, but sometimes you just confirm basic plausible. It doesn't have to be perfect, but at least it shouldn't be missing. At least it should say the best way to get from here to Seattle goes to Calgary and then leaves from Vancouver. I mean, that'd be crazy, right? Uh, how am I going to get from Calgary to Vancouver? It should be contiguous plots. So the point is you can do a lot with testing random by generating things. Um, you know, testers do that all the time, right? ASDF, the most common name for testing, right? So you, they just generate things randomly and you can do it in an automated way. Any questions about this? Yeah. Uh, on the random. Yeah. Yeah. So the square roots. Yeah. Uh, wasn't it like so what you would want to do is test when you square it, it's less that the absolute value of a difference from the number you gave it is less than some epsilon, less than some really small number. So you say we'll allow a tolerance of error of 0 0.0001 or something like that. Or you know. No more than 10 to the minus six, and that should be probably two to the minus something times the value you gave it. So, proportionately, it's no more than, you know, one out of two or four eight uh, fractional errors or something. That's how you do it. And you're absolutely right. I mean, floating point numbers get rounded, and you get back weird things like 1.9999999 when it's really chippy. So you can't test reliably that it's exactly, exactly equal. You have to test that it's no different than a really small error. And, and when you work with body point numbers, you do that for But very good point. And maybe there are doing errors that cover this. 
It's a point I expect my graduate students to know, and I'm really good to point it out. Really. Floating point is not. Uh, good. Uh, any other questions about, about either of these orthogonal arrays or, or this idea of random testing, particularly conformational random testing, where we sort of take the system's response to a random thing and test its basic plausibility? Here's an idea for your project uh, with address U. Uh, maybe it's a bit hard sometimes to generate randomly possibilities within a given risk level. But what you could do, what you could do is generate successive tests um, randomly. And each time you add a little bit more to one of the variables, maybe you add a little bit more to the, I don't know whether they um, whether they're in a relationship that's been problematic or the number of times they've been in contact with such and such. But you make it a little bit worse each time. You make sure its risk level is worse than the last one, or no, no better than the last one. So you make sure it's not decreasing because you're adding to its risk by some random amount, right? Um, so you don't know what the true answer is, but you want to make sure it doesn't go down. So that would be a way of, of again, ruling out certain classes of errors, right? Testing is not perfection. Testing is pragmatism, coupled with being intelligent about where to put our efforts. It's about being judicious about testing the things that matter. And often the things that matter are pairwise things rather than all possibilities. Often the things that matter are the general features of what we get, even if we can't test the exact answer. So these are principles to live by. Okay. Any questions? Okay. So um, in many cases, we don't have the option of confirming correct and just test plausibility and test that it may it has some basic sound features. Okay, now I want to talk in our remaining time today, going into our next few lectures, about a different type of test. I've been talking about black box tests. And now I'm going to be talking about glass box tests. Sometimes use term the misnomer of white box tests. The idea here is we can peer inside the box. And look inside. You can see the outcome. You can see the formula we're using as part of the code. We know the data structures. We know the possible paths through the program. Or we know the paths through the system as a whole. Maybe we're not looking at a particular piece of the system, a particular algorithm, but we're looking maybe for. The, the system as a whole, the possible states it can be in, the possible sort of progression of a user in terms of use cases through the system, the screens they go through, the steps that they go through. Have they selected a daycare center? Yes, for example. Have they logged into the system? Are they just browsing on the home site or something? Have they already filled out a you know, a, a risk level statement, um, et cetera. Do they have a message in the box? So glass box tests allow us to sort of reason about the structure of the system in a way that's less blind to, to the details. And they can allow us to more quickly identify a certain type of error. What type? Implementation errors where we make a mistake in implementation and diverges from our design. Um, and, and it's easier than going through the door. So treat it like a black box, just testing it. Does it match its specification? Is what it does correct? Uh, does it correctly align with, with its behavior? 
Okay, so here we like to focus tests of automatic modules, places where there's a lot of, I don't know, allocation going on, a lot of complex calculations, a lot of tricky manipulation of data, a lot of unpacking of data from a martial form or whatever. Um, areas that are less covered by coverage testing, as I put it, and corner cases, et cetera. Um, and there's some algorithm specific testing that might be involved. Um, so there's a whole set of techniques here. We're going to be talking for a while about them. They include a variety of coverage techniques. These include path coverage, logic coverage, graph coverage, et cetera. Um, and you can go beyond that to kind of do testing in ways that you follow where the data goes or the, the flow of the program. You can observe values along the way or observing how does it free up resources? Does it close files after an exception? For example, does it close a connection to the database if an exception to the lack of memory is raised, et cetera? And confirm the integrity of data structures. So this is the idea of glass box sets. And we're going to dive into one of these in more detail. This idea of path test. We're going to see. We're going to talk about path tests, but really we're talking about coverage tests. We're going to cover a set of kind of possible. Um, possible paths through the program or possible logical condition. Okay, so here we go. Uh, let's let's dive into uh, this side of things. Okay. Um, okay. Um, by the way, does anyone keep an eye out for questions online? That'll be great. There's this weird mode. How about defense? Maybe it's maybe it's a link for, uh, of, of Zoom, but there's this weird bug where um, if you have as the presenter a view, uh, you're you're trying to view the chat window. Um, it will sometimes occlude what remote people see on their screen, and so it's like it it sometimes doesn't show what's under the chat window. So if I call up the chat window on here just to see what's being said, it will, it seems sometimes block other people from seeing. At least that's that's been my observation. What's the bigger issue though with this is you know, some developers, you get to be a connoisseur of bugs. You spot really interesting bugs. It's, it's, uh, it's kind of like a field guide to bugs. Right? Um, so there's a, a really interesting one where it gets in a mode where it creates a window in the background. It's not in the foreground, I don't see it. I'm presenting, you know, presenting to some large group. And in the background, unbeknownst to me, there's a Zoom window that says, go back to your presentation. Well, it's, it, there's a button that says you can go back or start a new meeting, blah, 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 blah. Um, and that blocks the screen for people. So they see this big black square or rectangle on my screen, but never is it, never do I see it. It's just there's some window in the back. Anyway, um, I think that's kind of cool, though, but it's, it's kind of uncool in a few ways. Um, I, I don't think I love it, but uh, it's it's an interesting element of this function. I don't know why computationally that would block the view of the path in the back, and I don't know why it comes up. Okay, coverage testing. So let's talk about coverage testing. Um, the idea here is we use models. We use we use models that represent some underlying situation, and we reason explicitly about them. We we have some model that detects the flow to the program, or that detects the set of all possible logical conditions, or the flow through the entire system, and we reason about coverage on that. Okay. Um, so we've talked in 371 about some things like test matrices, orthogonal arrays, decision tables. Remember those set of all possibilities for premium adjustment? Remember that? Or the, based on age and number of previous 
planes that would charge you different amounts or send you a letter or say, you know, you are terminated. People cry. Um, uh, we're going to talk about flow graphs and, and some decision criteria uh, here. So coverage comes in many forms. It's kind of like Halloween costumes. It's the same coverage behind the scenes, it just it has different masks. Um, there's state-based coverage of nodes. So here it's like, where is it reaching? So when you run a coverage test with you know with any number of different methods that you do this, typically it's doing state-based coverage. It's what points in the program are being reached. Maybe the program, the points are full functions, but maybe they're points within a function. Um, transition coverage is another form. What, you know, it's like which you want to make sure you, if you have an if statement, you've gone one test at least each way. Because if you haven't tested both ways, if and then the else, how can you be seriously said to try to help? Um, prime paths is another pretty strong technique, which if you can't in general explore all possible paths, but you can be again clever about choosing what paths you do, you do explore. Prime paths, kind of like all pairs testing, it is a clever way of picking paths that in some sense are pretty thorough. Um, it'll catch many cases, and we're going to talk about that. And then there's some ones called constraint based uh, coverage. Um, and coverage testing can occur at a sort of high level, even a black box, and, a, and at a lower level. Okay, so here's an APM button. This is a diagram for me. I don't need to tell it. For giving out one, right? Oops. Presumably, you know about this thing called uh, cash. Um, uh, Never know these days. And um, there's a thing other than Bitcoin. Um, but uh, cash uh, is dispensed by ATMs, right? Um, and uh, with ATMs, there's a sort of a script you go through with the ATM. You go to the ATM, you insert your card, you're prompted for a PIN, right? To enter your secret number and depending on what you enter different things will happen i don't know how much you folks have exercised this uh, over the years i've exercised various aspects of the system um so certain entries will let you then select what you want to do and you type in the amount of money or whatever and it will spit out money on you and have it in your account and you go and it gives you back your card to go home. But there's there's actually many other scenarios that are pretty interesting. Anyone want to tell me what's another scenario that might happen beyond the kind of obvious one where you go, stick your card in, tuck your pin, go say you want a certain amount of money, it gives you the money, and you take your card and leave. Give me another scenario that could happen. Yes, Sid. Yeah, you're just checking your account balance. It's good. So instead of requiring cash, you're just checking what is the current balance on maybe your multiple accounts and, and you check them. Good. What's another one? Find out. Yes, recess. Good. So you just say, give me the default amount and it gives it to you quick. You don't have to type it up. Excellent. Yeah. What's another scenario that could help? Yes, Larissa. Uh, yeah, okay, so you could like pay bills. Yep, that, that's right. Um, Lee. Yeah, you put the pin in wrong. And then then it's got to do something, right? Um, and what it does is actually kind of interesting. It'll let you input it a certain number of times. Then guess what happens? Then it like sucks your card in. It doesn't give it back to you. Um, and it says like, you know, uh, go to jail. No, it doesn't say go to jail. It says like, go talk to a teller or something. 
and you need to get your card back. Um, so it can confiscate your card. And actually, if you do it with an expired card, it will confiscate your card. Um, so uh, it's a card expired. That's true. Or the card is, has been declared lost. It'll just like suck it up. Um, one time it occurred to me. <laughs> yeah, man, when I was young, you know, I took my card one time. Uh, and didn't even ask me. And it's true. Yeah, no, it's, there's some weird things that I've had with this. I think one person I knew, you know, went there and they put their card in and gave it back and it's like, <laughs> there, are so, there are some wild stories that, that circulate the 80s and 90s on these things. Um, uh, but I'm not going to go into the urban legends, you know, that spat out, you know, US dollars instead of Canadian. Gave me, uh, it gave me a lottery ticket. Uh, so, um, but the point is, there's actually all these possibilities, right? Um, because when you start withdrawing money, just like Marissa said, you know, you actually have a set of options, and sometimes actually you don't have enough money in the account, and it'll refuse to give you, or you're over the daily balance, and it will say like, ah, I'm not going to give it to you, or it'll it will to give you everything up to the daily balance, but not the full amount, right? And it's trying to debit your account for the full amount. It can only give it debit it for what it gave you. So when you actually un you know, when you actually parse this out, there's actually quite a few possibilities. You think of it as like uber simple, but it ain't uber simple. It's actually a lot of possibilities. And it's all got to be done transactional, right? It, it shouldn't give you money and not debit your account for it. That would make the bank go out of business. It shouldn't, it shouldn't, you know, give you a debit the money and not give you the money, not give it to you. It, it shouldn't. Give you, you know, charge you the full amount if it can only give you a partial amount because your account benefits, et cetera. So it's got to handle all these conditions. This is a pretty serious business. Um, yeah, there's some there's some interesting stories about how they do service on these machines and so on. Um, so yeah, okay, I won't get into that. Uh, there, there, when I was in university, there was a uh, there was a set of students. This was actually at MIT, and there was a set of students of the raw. <laughs> they, they, put, they put sawdust all around to muffle the noise and went in and tried to, <laughs> tried to break into it. Um, and this was like 4 a.m. Um, they, um, they ended up getting caught because I think it set off a secret alarm. Um, and so they ended up getting arrested. They, when the police went there, you know, they found all the sawdust. It's a good fire hazard. But anyway, um, <laughs> that was the ATM war. Um, so, uh, so the ATM is a system that you might want to test, right? Like, if you're a bank and you've invested in this ATM software, you want to be confident that it works. So, what you got to do to develop confidence that this works? You don't feel like the sawdust. Um, what do you got to do to develop confidence that it works? Again, you, you can't play, you can't pass the red face test unless you do at least what level of testing. And what? Why it's called coverage testing. What level of testing would you at least start to develop some confidence that this is worth thinking about the point? Yes, Jeremy. Okay, you gotta do the happy path. Okay, so at least the happy path should work, right? But customers can be pretty unhappy if the, if other things besides the it's convoluted. Um, if the happy path is the only one that's guaranteed, you can still have some unhappy customers and unhappy banks, bank folks, right? Um, like if customers' card were confiscated once every two times or something like that, or it was confiscated upon the entry of the first mistake in the pin entry. Someone could be pretty upset, right? Be like, dude, you ate my card. Uh, my card's gone. Now I gotta go talk to the teller and the bank's closed for the night or something like that. Um, so it's 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 not it's not just a happy path we have to deal with. We have to 
deal with various stuxnet constraints, right? Um, and in general, I would argue that each of these paths through the system, each of these branches, at least, we've got to explore once, right? So you've got to try it with an expired card. Let's suppose you use an expired card and it doesn't confiscate it. Banks don't going to be that happy. Or if people call in about a card being lost and it's not confiscated, instead they can they can just withdraw money. That's not going to leave the customer who lost the card happy, right? They went through all the steps to alert the bank and still they're being charged, right? Uh, to buy things on GameStop or whatever. Um, and so, you know, you want to check if they don't have sufficient funds, that they can't withdraw money, if banks going to want that, right? Um, want to make sure it's a valid account, that the account still exists at the bank, blah, blah, blah. So you really want to try it with possibilities. And there's things you might not even have thought about, like where it's the wrong card, right? Maybe I enter BMO card at Scotiabank, or I enter the TD card at, at you know, um, uh, at the credit union, and, and it should deal with the card that's not recognized. So, like, I don't know what this card is, right? If the magnetic strip is destroyed or something like that. Okay. So, this is an example of a system at a high level that you could diagram out. This is not a particular algorithm. It's not like we're you know, diagramming out the merge sort algorithm, but it's a it's a structured depiction of the system. It's a model of the system, and we're trying to use it to pick intelligent test cases. But we want at least one test case to go this way. We want that goes this way. We want one test case that goes this way. One test case that goes like this, right? Um, one that. Uh, has the handles the invalid pin and as well as the happy path um, you want to hear here you do you know um for selecting withdrawal which is the only case dealt with you want to deal with an invalid account or for a valid account where it's uh, exceeded etc you need to explore this thoroughly mm -hmm. so models like this can be constructed for your system and you want to talk, Jeremy, about happy path. I'll tell you one path. Oh, computer project. Um, it'll be a, a happy path for all. Um, it'll be a happy path for you, a happy path for me. Um, so give me a model like this of your system and convince me you've used it to, to inform some choice of paths. Like, Use case test, system test. This is an ideal vehicle for picking system tests, right? Each of your systems is going to look have a different characterization like this. But you know, you might have screens on the app, right? Um, for the team that's that has a website also for configuring the system, you're gonna be you're gonna be dealing with that side of it. Um, it might have its own system diagram. But give me a structured diagram for you know how you handle failure to log in or a new user account, right? And once they're in the system, what what can they do? And maybe it differs based on whether they filled out the risk assessment in the past and and whether they have a message in the model. So you should be able to diagram all this all this out for the uh, the child care plate waste studies. You should. You know, it's different paths based on if they've already chosen a, a care center to work with, et cetera. So you should be able to diagram something like this out. And you should be able to, to relate what's here with some of your use case tests, right? Some of your system tests. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a prescription for a proof. Okay. Um, so it's, I mean, it's, it, it, it goes beyond just though. It goes beyond Mark. Um, here we, we want to reason about what's going on and make sure we've covered this. So coverage testing, 
at a basic level that's that's Kaprekov by cover chest and tools. That's good. But it's not going to tell you, you know, at a high level about if you tested all the various possibilities with user level. It, it's going to be at a part of that level to that, tell you about certain areas of the program. Um, and I'd like to see this created for your system. Awesome. Um, so this is one side of of, of um, path cover. Another side is, is what's called state cover. So this is for making flight reservations. You know, it used to be that you would make this distinction between, okay, well, do you have a reservation of some sort? Is it paid for yet? Because sometimes you can make a reservation and say, I want to I do this, and it's good for 24 hours, um, and then you can pay for it during that time, otherwise it will expire. There's some systems that have worked like that. And then is it ticketed? In other words, is it, is, is it actually a ticket issued for it? That used to be a separate process. And there's all these possibilities, right? You pay for it, then you ask for a refund. You cancel. Or maybe you make the reservation and cancel, or maybe it expires time-wise. Maybe you ticket it and you apply for a refund or it gets the ticket. Maybe the flight is canceled. And that's another possibility for how you handle it. And the idea is, look, you want to you want to make sure you handle these different possibilities. If there's a refund possibility, you want to make sure the customer gets the refund as long as they meet the criteria. And so the point is, once again, look, a high level diagram of this can give this, give us this ability to reason about what have we covered and what have we not covered, right? Um, simple idea. Um, and you can cover it to different levels. This is called state coverage. You've gone to each of these states. The state is, I have made my reservation, but I haven't yet paid. Or I paid my reservation, but it's not yet ticketed. Or, you know, it's been canceled by the customer or canceled because they didn't pay. Those are different states. And we reach each state. This, this is path coverage. We test all possible paths. And that's actually a much stronger problem. With the state coverage, we just keep track that we have gotten to this state. With the path coverage, we, we kept track of how we got to that state. Now, these same ideas can be applied at different levels. They can also be applied, for example, at the level of low-level system operations, say within a, within a piece of code. This is a piece of C code. Um, reasoning about with different line numbers, different places here. And you can reason about that in the same sort of way. Reason about which way the paths of the system go. So here you have a while loop, you have some initialization, a while loop. And basically you ask, is, do we have any more data? And if not, uh, we, we leave and, um, and we basically uh, are finished up the string we're producing, which is the URL decoded, the, the decoded version of the URL. Uh, otherwise, we go through and we process the next character, and depending on if it's a special character or not, we handle it differently. This is a normal character, this is a special character, and we handle very special character, characters. These are little bits of code. These are like three lines of C code. Same basic principles, though. You want to create a model of it. You want to reason about what you have to cover. You figure out ways you can get to each of these places, classes of sort of ways that you could achieve that, conditions that would allow you to achieve it. Then you come up with particular test cases that will reach those points and will fall within them. Okay, um, so uh, here we're, we're reasoning about this and, and we're reasoning about it to derive test cases. Okay, um, this, is, uh, this is the idea. Um, so here are the key steps. This is, by the way, very likely to be a problem. So when you have a 
of test coverage. To be past coverage, to be logic coverage, node coverage, uh, branch coverage within within uh, paths. There's basically three things that you're going to three steps you're going to go through. So these three steps, and I want you to to remember them well, and we'll let you proceed. Through. Number one, we identify the set of things we need to cover. Maybe it's branches in the code. Maybe it's transitions in that high level, for example, the ATM code, you know, where you have a branch, right? Maybe alternatively, it's the nodes of that diagram. It's the state that you can be in. You've entered the pin uh, and, and it's correct and it's just waiting for input. Or maybe it's prompting you to enter the pen. Those are two different states. You might be, you know, getting in a certain state of the system. Maybe it's prime paths, which are going to be a kind of set of possibilities of, of paths we want to cover. But we identify whatever it is. We identify what we want to cover. We enumerate them. We identify where we are in the diagram or what. We're doing. So that's step one. And that'll be a little bit different for each of these, but the basic principle holds. We identify this. Identify the transitions, or identify the states, or identify the prime paths, or whatever. The, the logical convention. Two, we, de we develop a set of abstract scenarios that include these things. It's kind of like with equivalence classes. We identify these equivalence classes. All equivalent classes, but that doesn't commit it to particular test, particular test cases within it. It doesn't specify the exact string when all it is is like the string is non non zero length and start is less than finish, which is less than or equal to the length of the string minus one, but they're both start and finish are greater than zero. Um and Maybe we we restrain them to not be uh, the end values of the start, so the return. That's a that's a test case. Another test case possibility would be a non-empty string is specified and start equals zero and finish equals the length of string minus one. That's another possibility, right? These are kind of abstract scenarios. I say abstract because they don't get into the concrete. Is it the string foo bar or is it bar foo or is it two bar bad or is it two bar bad bad or what have you? It's abstract scenarios. And then you develop a set of test cases. These are very specific test cases. They have particular values for each of the arguments. A particular string, particular values for start, particular values for finish. So it's foo bars, the string, and the start is zero, and the finish is five. Or it's foo bar, and the start is two, and the finish is three. Um, these are concrete test cases that fall within those scenarios. And once you have these test cases for each of these scenarios, then you've covered all the things you want to stress, that you want to cover. Okay. So number one. Identify the things you want to cover. Identify in the diagram, for example. Number two, identify a set of ways to go through the system that will cover all those things. Number three, figure out the test cases that will exercise the way through that system. Okay. These are very specific test cases, very particular values. Um, so that they could be executed. That you could tell someone, go type this in and execute it for your test. Boom, done. Okay, that's what we want. Those are the steps of the coverage procedure. Okay. Um, okay. Um, I think we're over time. But next time we're going to be talking about how to use path coverage. And the idea here is we're going to be wending our way, whether it's at the level of code or at the level of a whole system we're going to be figuring out the paths through the system that will achieve a certain level of coverage 
maybe a node coverage. We reach each of these kind of um, ellipses, or maybe it's rounded rectangles, or maybe it's transition coverage. We want paths that will cover each of these transitions at least. We'll be reasoning about path coverage, and we'll um, we'll see how we can use that type of coverage to build up test test scenarios. And having created those scenarios, having one or more test cases, specific cases that will exercise this. Okay, that is all for today. And with those words, it will work. Okay, I do have officers now. Thank you.